All right, we are recording. And one final note, every other Thursday, we meet with someone at NCAR uh, who works at NCAR, learn about what they do in their jobs and answer questions from those of you who are joining us. And one really cool part about working at NCAR is that there are so many different types of jobs, such as a scientist, engineer, electrician, computer programmer, uh, safety expert, machinist, translator, uh, that all these different jobs and more help support the science research that we do. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David, who's going to tell you more about what he does and uh, take your questions. Good morning, David. Well, thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, let me click on the sharing button here. Uh, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. All right, great. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is David Rusi, and I work as Spanish translator and translator co translation coordinator at the Comet program, which is a small group of about 40 scientists, instructional designers, and technical support staff who create training lessons on a variety of scientific topics, many with a focus on meteorology. And these are then published to our website called, Web, called MedEd. Now, today I'll just talk to you briefly about translation in general, and then give you a, a bit of an idea about the tools that I use to translate. And I'll also mention why Comet translates its lessons. And by the end, I hope to have given you an idea of why I love this work. So before I go on, I'd just like to ask you if you can think of any ways that you use translations or that translations might be part of your life. Just send, send us a chat message and I'll come back to this. So one of the great benefits of working at Comet has been the ability to travel. For example, I spent time in Mexico City. And in, in this picture, you see me in front of uh, an ancient Aztec pyramid in, in the center of, of Mexico City. And much of the time that I spent there was at the meteorological office. Uh, this is a historical building uh, that dates back to the 1700s. And it also houses the, uh, the uh, weather observatory, which is on the roof of the building. Now, I wanna stress that these travels are not just for fun. My, my main objective is to sharpen my skills and to take classes. I also work closely with professionals to improve my knowledge and skills and to learn about the science that I translate. Uh, this picture here shows a course that I attended in Chiapas uh, in the city of uh, Tuxla Gutierrez. And this is the new building that they had just finished building. Um, and you can see they also have an observatory on the roof. And of course, I get to see beautiful sites. This is uh, the Popocatepetl volcano uh, just outside of Mexico City. Uh, I also get to see museums and I get to go to archaeological sites such as uh, Palenque in southern Chiapas. So very briefly, what is translation? Well, there are many definitions. You can look them up in the dictionary. But basically, it is expressing what's written in one language in another language. Fundamentally. It is how humans communicate and transmit knowledge across languages and cultures. Um, my own definition, which I, I wrote here, includes three specific words. Completely, meaning that all the text needs to be translated. Accurately, which refers to the fact that there should be no mistakes or omissions. And appropriately, in a way that the, that the audience of the text will be able to um, understand it well. As a point of detail, I'll also mention that we generally distinguish between two forms of translation. Interpreting, which involves conveying the spoken word, and translation proper, which involves the written word. So let's go back to my questions. What are some ways that translation is part of your life? Well, David, we do have a, an, a, a very interesting response from Isha, Renta, if I pronounce that correctly, I apologize if I haven't. Uh, she writes that at home in Fredericksburg, Virginia, she, that's where she is, she worked five and a half years in the weather service translating and providing services to the Spanish community. Thank and you. now she's at the NOAA headquarters, uh, still working with uh, the Latinx community, the AMS at Latinx community, community or sorry, committee, and one of the focuses is a translation of meteorological terms. Wow, that's fantastic. I, a fellow translator is on the line. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, 
but I would like to say that I can expand on this because whenever we read the news today and we read something that happened in a distant land, I, you know that a translator had to tell the newspaper that you're reading in your own language about that in their own language. So a translator was probably involved. Or when world leaders meet to talk about diplomacy and treaties and international regulations, or when business people get together to discuss how to market a product overseas, uh, a translator is needed. And of course, when you read uh, a fabulous book in your own language that was originally written in another language, you know that translators were involved in that too. And, and speaking of literature and classics, do you have any idea what uh, the most translated and published book is? Go ahead and chat it and I'll come back to this too. I think I have a guess, but let's see what comes in over the chat. So I'm gonna go on and I'll ask you about this in a minute. But um, as I said, I, I, in 15 years of Comet, I've had many opportunities to travel, including Argentina. Uh, I was able to live in Buenos Aires for about six weeks in a small apartment that I rented. And I worked at the uh, main uh, meteorological office you see pictured here. Uh, these letters here in front, SMN, um, stand for Servicio Meteorológico Nacional, which is the uh, Spanish version of the National Weather Service, NWS. It's essentially their logo for the same time. Um, now, Buenos Aires is a fantastic city. In this picture, what looks like a little city inside the big city is actually a famous uh, cemetery called La Recoleta, where many of uh, Argentina's most notable people are buried today. And this is the Casa Rosada, the pink house. Um, it's the equivalent to our White House, with the difference that their president doesn't actually live there. Mm. <clears throat> and here you have a picture of me in front of Mafalda. Uh, Mafalda is a beloved uh, cartoon character created in the 60s by Kino, who uh, unfortunately passed away just last week. Now, for centuries, the traditional tools of translation were pretty simple, pen and paper, reference materials, once they invented them, glasses. <laughs> <laughs> but um, translation practice probably changed very little throughout the century until the typewriter became available. And for the first time, translators were able to produce a text, a translated text that was not handwritten. Um, oh, I almost forgot. I asked you about the most translated book. Did you get any ideas, Tim? Yes, we did. And there are three, four different areas that people think might uh, encompass that answer. And one of them is the book War and Peace, or novel, War and Peace, uh, the Bible, or another religious text. And then fourth, if you want to say that, uh, Homer's Odyssey. Uh, interesting choices. Well, the fact is that uh, the Bible is the most translated book. It has been translated in hundreds of languages and there have been thousands of editions of it. But interesting, interestingly, the most translated non-religious non book is Pinocchio. Oh. Pinocchio was written in Italian by a, name, a man named Collodi in the late 1880s. And uh, The Little Prince, which you see here in a Japanese translation, and Alice in Wonderland, which you see here in a Spanish version of the Disney version, uh, are uh, two other books that make up the, usually the top 10 of most translated books. Fascinating. So what really revolutionized translation was uh, computing. Today's professional translators have to know more than languages. They have to learn to use software, new ways to research, and like scientists, we use tools but we don't use them to gather or record data, but we use them to speed up our work or to do, to do research. For example, I use a tool called, it's a, kind of, it's a special kind of software called translation memory. And the reason it's called memory is because it remembers what I've already translated. Here's a screenshot of a tool I use at work. It's called MemoQ, you can see the name right here. And on the screen, you can see that there's a column with English text, uh, it's divided into what we call segments, usually they're sentences. And then to the right of it, you see a column for Spanish. This column with these numbers in percentages show the percentage of match to something I've translated before. So when I see 
this green 100% match, I know that I've translated produced by the Comet program as producido por <coughs> the Comet program sometime in the past. When the match is less than 100%, such as you can see in this segment that's highlighted, um, the program shows me the differences in this, in this box here. And then I can select from a list of, of previous translations and then I can just go in there and make the changes that are needed, accept it, and go on. And the program will continue to build the translation memory as I continue to work. It's, a, it's just a database, but it is designed specifically for translators. So of course, this I also use these tools, they're called dictionaries, and I have lots of them. Uh, but <laughs> unfortunately, they're static. Uh, they're very hard to update, they're costly. And so with time, I find that I use them less and less. Instead, what has become a main tool for me is, um, I'm gonna give you the example with Google, but you know, search engines in general are uh, just a, an incredibly important uh, tool. Here you see a, a, a search, a simple search for the definition of Punto de Rocio, which means uh, dew point. And you can see that Google points me to the Wikipedia page and then other resources. So there is one more tool that I want to show you, um, and it's called machine translation or automatic translation. So today, machine translation is available to anyone, but it has to be used with caution. Let me give you an example of why. If I show you the word ball, you'll probably think of something like this, which in Spanish is called the pelota. Uh, but if I say Cinderella's ball, you will probably think of something more like this. Now, this is called baile in Spanish. You don't have to remember these words, just note how they're different. So ball has many meanings. And uh, if I say, have a ball, you know that I mean, have fun. And this in Spanish is expressed with the verb divertirse. Now, I asked Google's machine translation engine to translate, I had a ball from English to Spanish. Now, uh, you don't know what I mean by this. I mean, I may mean I had a soccer ball or I may mean I had a, a good time. And of course, Google doesn't know either. So it just sticks in what it thinks it might be. And in this case, it says, <laughs> I had a ball. Now this is grammatically is not correct, but let's skip that for the moment. So then I asked Google to translate, I had a ball with the ball, meaning I had fun with the ball. And as you can see, the translation includes the word for soccer ball, I'll call it, twice. What this in fact says, if I translate it back, is I had a soccer ball with the soccer ball, which of course is nonsense. Here's a corrected, a corrected version, me diverti con la pelota, which uses this verb and this noun. So just for fun, I thought I would take it one more step and I asked Google to translate, I had a ball at the ball with the ball. <laughs> as you can see, you don't need to know Spanish. Google uh, translated this as I had a soccer ball in the soccer ball with the soccer ball. Here's the translation corrected. Me diverti en el baile con la pelota. So you can see that this tool has to be used with caution. Of course, this is a limit example, but like this, there are hundreds of ways in which uh, Google can make mistakes. And the reason for that is because it doesn't actually understand the text that's input in the box. Uh, it has no way of understanding context and it, it, it's just unable to make certain decisions that a human translator can make. For so this reason, I was going to say, David, it sounds like it's pretty important to have a professional translator look at work if you're doing it for professional. Absolutely. Translators. You, you, you can use Google Translate or any other machine translation uh, tool to get the gist of something. But if you are going to um, do any serious work with it, you should have someone that understands the target language in order to be able to make sure that there are not this kind of gross mistakes, at least. So. All right. So. Sorry, I was clicking on the wrong thing. <laughs> so why do we translate the comment, comment materials and comment lessons? As I said, there's, there are many reasons to translate, but sharing scientific knowledge is especially important in a connected world. I mean, think about it. 
scientists at UCAR gather data, they analyze it, they find ways to use it. And then groups like Comet create lessons that are an important bridge to communicate that knowledge to other people. By providing our lessons in Spanish and other languages, Comet supports science in Spanish speaking communities, both here, such as in Puerto Rico, for example, and in other places like Mexico, Spain, or Central and South America. This helps countries <clears throat> to have material to train and update their staff. If you wonder why that matters, consider how much safer you will feel when you travel abroad knowing that meteorologists forecasting at your destination are well-trained. Comet today offers over 500 lessons in English, uh, almost 200 in Spanish, about 90 in French, and also in a smattering of other languages such as Portuguese and even Chinese. This lesson was developed in uh, collaboration with the Taiwanese uh, uh, weather service. So, wow, I think I've told you a lot of stuff about translation in these less than 15 minutes and why Comet translates its materials. As for why I love my work, well, yeah, it lets me travel I, and I love it. Uh, these last pictures were taken in Spain. I lived there for six weeks as well, and I continue to do my regular work for Comet, but I also spend time with meteorologists at the Agencia Estatal de Meteorología, which is called IMET. Uh, this, by the way, is their name for the National Weather Service, uh, just slightly different from the one in Argentina. I also got to visit other um, med offices. This picture was taken in Toledo, you can see the Alcázar in the back, and uh, their office is just a medieval building. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, I also got to visit some schools uh, where they were checking up on, uh, on weather stations. So these travels allow me to make lasting connections and to improve my skills, and they're a part of my job that I absolutely love. But more importantly, I get a great deal of satisfaction knowing that my work has a positive impact on thousands of people all over the world. So thank you very much for being here with me and for being interested in my work. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. And, or you can write to me at that address, at the email address that's listed on the slide. Well, thank you for sharing, David. Your work is fascinating, at least to me. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so we are open up for questions now. We already have a, a thank you from, uh, let's see, Virginia. And um, we'll see if there are any other, if any questions show up in the chat. So we'll wait for just a couple of minutes to see if we, ah, yeah. So we had a question in school, David, did you study science or language or both? Uh, well, I studied both. I, I started uh, being interested in astronomy. Um, but I like science in general, so I, I took every 101 course in science that I could think of, including botany. Um, but I soon realized that I really didn't have the, um, the basis, the, the, the math and the physics that I needed to continue in that. Uh, and at the same time, I started studying Spanish and I fell in love with it. And my career in school was actually in literature. I studied Latin American literature. Um, so, but that has proven to be um, the, the real basis for my work, because of course, what it takes to be a translator is to be able to write well. Oh, fascinating. And uh, we do have another question um, from Virginia. We hear of, uh, thanks for teaching us about translation. And uh, this visitor was asking, or was wondering, are there climate concepts that are particularly challenging to translate? Climate what? Uh, climate concepts of uh, like global climate concepts like flow i see i'm having trouble explaining them <laughs> is there anything that when you're if you're you have to translate something into related to the climate of the earth that are there challenges yeah, well, there? I, I wouldn't you know off the top of my head i can't think of a specific climate term that i find difficult to translate uh but all terms always pose a challenge i i keep a a glossary, which is a dictionary of terms that I translate. Um, in the 15 years that I've been doing that, I've compiled about uh, 1,300, I mean, 13,000 terms in this glossary. Um, um, what about concepts like uh, El Nino? That's on a much larger scale. It's... Right. No, well, but these concepts uh, exist and have been translated. Nino, of course, it's called the Nino because it's a Spanish word. Uh, but um, and by the way, it takes the tilde on top of the N. 
Otherwise, Nino doesn't mean anything. Um, so, I mean, I always encounter terms that are difficult to translate uh, and they require research. I have to find um, either glossaries or dictionaries that deal with those topics or um, uh, like published papers, those kinds of things that can allow me to extract the terminology. Okay. There are times when I have to invent things or just describe them. Is, uh, that does happen. I, I can't think of an example off the top of my head right now. But if, if someone, if you were to translate global warming, would that, or uh, that concept of global warming, is that challenging or is it? No, it's, it's not challenging. The challenging part is that there are several ways of saying that okay. uh, in Spanish. And that is, a, that is a, a problem that crops up frequently in translation. Um, if a term was originally coined in one language, the other language, and Spanish is particularly the case because we have people that speak Spanish in, uh, I believe it's almost 20 countries. And so in each of those places, they might develop their own terminology for a particular concept. Mm -hmm. Then the challenge becomes uh, finding which one of those terms is most understood in order to use it. And sometimes what I do is I include uh, two or even three sometimes terms at the beginning when they're first mentioned so that people can see this. For example, uh, the word for runoff uh, in Spanish can be escorrentia or escurrimiento. There are two words and they're used in different places. So I use one term in the text, but generally I will list both of them the first time it's mentioned. Wow, this is involved. Uh, and there, thank you for all of that clarification. There are two more very good questions in here already. Uh, the first one is any advice for beginning Spanish study tools or online programs mm. uh, if you're learning the language? Uh, that's outside of my uh, ability to answer, unfortunately. I, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with beginning Spanish tools. I, I do know that um, uh, Babbel, for example, has um, a learning series that appears to be pretty successful. Okay. And we do have the next question then would be, how difficult or easy is it to translate technical terms in Spanish? I found it's hard to, this is the end of the statement, is I found it's hard to have consistency because of different countries interpreting differently. Um, similar questions uh, to what was asked earlier. Right, and, and, and the answer is it can be difficult. Uh, and as I said, often the problem is that you have too many choices and you have to decide what to do. I, I'll give you an, ex an example that I came across years ago. Um, this guy right here is a thumb drive, right? And uh, I, I um, had to uh, review a translation that was done in Costa Rica. Now, uh, this has several names in Spanish, and, and in fact, it has. Uh, I, I would guess it probably has 10 different names. But in, in Costa Rica, in this translation, they use llave maya, which means the key of the mayas. It's, a, it's just a beautiful, beautiful translation. I mean, a beautiful name for it. But unfortunately, it's only used in Costa Rica, nowhere else. Um, so I had to research that, find out that it was only used in Costa Rica, and then figure out what term I should actually use to, to translate this. So. I mean, that gives you an example. Localisms in Spanish are, are very common, so. And we are running close to time here. I just was wondering, uh, is, is um, Spanish or English your native language or how would you describe your native language? Yeah, well, that's complicated, but uh, I'll try to clarify it. So I was born in New York City. Uh, I learned English as a child, as a baby. Uh, when I was two years old, uh, my father went back to his homeland, which was Italy. And that's where I grew up. I grew up in a city called Bologna. If you, if you have a chance to look it up, it's a beautiful medieval city with two leaning towers, not one like Pisa. <laughs> and uh, I lived in Italy until I was 15 years old. At that time, I came back to the States, um, but I didn't speak English. And it took me many years to learn English. And uh, Spanish is actually my third language. I acquired it when I went back to school, when I went back to college. Um, then I lived in Spain for a time in Mexico, um, and I did my PhD work in um, Latin American literature, as I said, <clears throat> and uh, eventually married a Uruguayan woman, uh, and we speak Spanish at home. 
So, and, and I have been translating now for about 30 years into Spanish. I don't work into Italian. Uh, my Italian is, is very removed from, from my work activities. Well, David, this has just been fascinating. And uh, that's also been repeated in the chat and uh, we are up against time. So we'd like to thank you. It's been really fun exploring the job of Spanish translation and for telling us more about your work and thanks to everyone for joining us. We, and just a reminder, we are doing Meet the Experts sessions every other Thursday. So hopefully you'll join us again. The next session will be on October 29th. And we'll talk to someone who combines his experience with science, art, and video games into his job. And we are going to post in the chat right now. We already, Tiffany's already done that for us. Thank you. Uh, the Meet the Experts page for more information about upcoming sessions and links to recordings of our past sessions. So we are concluding here, but for those of you who will help us with the survey, uh, if you're in the grades of five through 12, and it looks like we do have at least three people on board doing that, uh, we're, and we're willing to help us with the survey, please hang on. We will be posting uh, in the chat a link to the uh, URL where you can uh, put in your reflections and help us out. And we have one last comment. Uh, the issues that have found the translation is how to make the translation work with different regions of the US, different cities, uh, have different majority of population from different countries. So it's hard to have a uh, consistency and for Isha, I believe it is. If you'd like to continue communicating with David, I'm sure he would love to chat with you more. And his email address is drussi at ucar.edu. And with that, we will say thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, David. Thank you, Tim. And thanks, everyone, for participating. I, I really appreciate your, your interest in my job. Bye, everyone.